Good afternoon. It's my uh, pleasure to come here and speak to you about some of the solar uh, research that we're doing. And uh, in the end, I'll break off and try to make a sales pitch for this experiment that we're hoping to run in 2017, which will involve a lot of the people from the citizen science community and hopefully some of you in the audience as well. Um, but first, let me start off by uh, talking about who I am and what I do. I'm an associate astronomer at the National Solar Observatory outside of Tucson, Arizona. And in this position, I do a lot of things uh, in terms of science. I like to study infrared uh, spectra and polarimetry. Um, but another hat that I wear is that I'm the uh, telescope scientist for the McMath Pierce uh, Solar Telescope. Uh, has anyone been to, to Kitt Peak and seen the observatories there? OK, a few of you. Um, if, if you've been there, you realize that this is a really uh, obvious telescope. It's a landmark. You can see it from about 60 miles away. Um, it's hard to miss. Here we have some of the collection of the world's largest telescopes. They're the third, the fifth, and the sixth largest solar telescopes on the planet. On top of a 100-foot tower, and then the light goes down, and actually the telescope extends twice as far below ground as you see here. Um, I'd like to talk today about some of the research that we do at the McMath, also at some of the research that we're planning to do with our new facility in Maui, and then end with the solar eclipse. But the unifying theme is how we're living in the atmosphere of the sun. Um, so being a telescope scientist is not all you know, research and academic work. Sometimes you have to do things like wash the windows. Um, we have a limited staff, and sometimes they're desperate enough to have the, the telescope scientists go up and wash the windows. Uh, during some seasons, the birds really like the mirrors that we have on top of a tower. They're very shiny, and we have to keep them clean. Uh, other parts of the facility also need cleaning regularly, and sometimes the telescope scientist is stuck doing the job of cleaning other aspects. You can tell we have budget problems because uh, we can only afford one glove for cleaning out the bathroom. <laughs> so it makes it sort of a dicey uh, exercise there. Um, and it's a little heartbreaking to realize I'm going to be the last telescope scientist at the McMath Pierce because we're aiming to shut down funding for the observatory in the next year or so. But I'm working really hard to develop a consortium of people who are interested in continuing the observations, the science, and the education that we do there. So again, if anyone is interested in a 1.6 meter solar telescope, really cheap. Please contact me after the, after the talk. So to get everybody on the same page, at the McMath Pierce we study the sun, and here we're breaking down uh, the sun into different components. And I'm sure everyone is uh, aware of the, the parts of the sun, but just to review, we have nuclear fusion going on in the core of the sun, where hydrogen is converted into helium. The fusion reactions release energy, and that energy travels outward from the core of the sun through the radiative zone uh, being transferred with radiation. The radiative zone goes out to about six-tenths of the solar radius. Beyond that, we have a zone called the convection zone, and the heat is transported by the process of convection. Um, so just like a pot of boiling water, where bubbles of gas carry the heat from the bottom of the pan, which is hot, to the top, which is cold, uh, uh, bubbles of gas carry the heat from the sun from the interior out to space. This ends at the photosphere, and if you saw the sun outside with a white light telescope, you saw the photosphere of the sun. Um, you can see sunspots today, and then also the top level of the convective hierarchy called granulation. So it's not quite like a, a pot of boiling water. The granules are the size of Texas, and they rise and fall at a mile per second, so it's a little bit more active. Um, above the photosphere, which I'm going to refer to as sort of the ground level of the sun, even though that's not quite right. Um, the sun has an atmosphere above that. And the first layer is the chromosphere, shown here as a slice. It's a thin layer, only about 10,000 kilometers in height. Um, and here, if you're using H-alpha or calcium K filters with a solar telescope, this is what you're looking at, you're looking at the features in the atmosphere at this level, or sometimes higher up uh, in prominences that you might see at the limb of the sun. Uh, the problem that we have in solar physics, or one of the many problems we have, is that the solar surface is about 6,000 Kelvin, and as you move away from that, the atmosphere heats up, becomes about 8,000 to 10,000 Kelvin. 
Uh, it's really unclear how that actually works. How does energy get transferred up to the higher level? And then how does that get deposited to heat the gas to a higher temperature than the, than the surface? It's a big mystery in solar physics still. But the chromosphere is a minor mystery compared to the corona of the sun. If you move further out past the chromosphere, you'll see the corona. And you know, as you're moving further away from the source of heat, the sun, you might expect the temperature to drop, but it doesn't. It rises to one or two million Kelvin, which is just ridiculous. So another major problem in solar physics is why the corona is, is as hot as it goes. Uh, how far does the corona extend? We know that it starts at the top of the chromosphere, but how far does it get? Certainly in this slide, you can see that the corona extends to about three solar radii. So does the corona extend beyond that? Okay, yes, it does. So here's a movie sequence from a NASA space mission, which shows uh, a couple of things. Here's a disk of the sun in extreme ultraviolet light. There's a zone, a little donut here, where we don't get data. Then the corona from the Lasco C2 coronagraph, and beyond that, the corona for the Lasco C3 coronagraph. You can see that the corona, if you look carefully, it has a solar wind, small particles that travel out along these streamers, but you can't miss the big storms that go through the corona. These are cor called coronal mass ejections. And when they interfere with electronics on the Lasco uh, instrument, you can see all sorts of high energy particle tracks in the camera. We'll talk more about the coronal mass ejections in the talk. But so what we can do is we can see out to about 30 solar radii here. We can look at data from another NASA mission called the Stereo Mission and uh, look at a movie again. So here's our tiny field of view. Stereo spacecraft have two other coronagraphs which extend well beyond the small field of view we saw in the previous movie. Here's the planet Mercury. Here's the planet Venus. And behind this occulting disk is the planet Earth. If you look closely as the movie repeats, you can see that some of the coronal mass ejection material can be traced almost out to the planet Earth, where we happen to live. Um, but is this the end of the corona? Does anyone think that the corona goes beyond the planet Earth? Yes, excellent. OK, you all pass. The corona actually extends through the entire solar system. And it ends at what we call a heliosheath. So the sun um, has an atmosphere that has to balance, the pressure in the atmosphere has to balance with the pressure from the interstellar medium, the gas that's surrounding the sun and the other stars in the galaxy. And that place where the pressure balances defines the edge of the solar atmosphere and where the solar wind stops. You may have heard that Voyager 1 has uh, crossed into this region um, recently on its way, and it's well past the orbit of Pluto. So the entire solar system is in this bubble called the heliosphere, which is really the outer atmosphere of the sun. So uh, this is something um, that I hope you can take away from this talk. Um, we can't really see this from inside the bubble, but we can look at other stars. Uh, and here's a picture from Hubble of a star in Orion. It's in a much denser part of the galaxy, so the gas and the features become more obvious here. But we think that this star is moving through this local interstellar medium in this direction. There's a bow shock, just like we think we have in our solar system. And we think that there is a little sphere which defines the outer boundary of this star, just like we have the heliosphere in our solar system. So um, the important concept is that we actually live, the whole solar system lives in the outer atmosphere of the sun. Now, it, it's not like the atmosphere of the Earth. You can't breathe it. The density is very low, better than any vacuum we can make here on the planet's surface. But the key concept is that when the sun has storms, and these storms travel through the atmosphere of the sun, it's not so surprising to think that they impact the Earth and have effects here when you understand that we're actually living in the outer atmosphere of the, star, of the sun. So here's my story about uh, solar storms. Um, way back when I was a younger uh, scientist and more eager, and I wanted to drive up to the telescope to observe before sunrise, I would leave Tucson at about 4.30 in the morning. And uh, for those of you who have been there, there's not much between Tucson and Kitt Peak. It's uh, a dark desert highway at 4.30 in the morning. Turns out there's one gas station. So on the morning of uh, May 19th, I was driving out there and noticed that my Chevy Blazer was running out of gas. And uh, I was like, oh, I need to stop to get gas. It'll be really risky if I try to go up to the mountain and come back. So it's 4.30 in the morning. Uh, the gas station is even more deserted than it is in this picture. Um, but we've got this new technology called pay at the pump. In 1997, that was new, along with pagers. Um, 
So I said, oh, I'll stop, I'll use the pay at the pump and I'll get some gas. So get out of my truck and swipe my credit card and it says denied, cannot authorize. Ugh, swipe my credit card again, same message. I, I paid my credit card bill, this is, shouldn't be happening to me. Swipe it again, still nothing. So I look more closely at my gas gauge and I'm thinking, well, if I'm careful, I can drive up slowly. And then when I'm done working, I can sort of coast down the mountain mostly and try to make it on fumes to the gas station. You know, it'll be dinner time, there'll be people there. And I can use that old fashioned method, you know, cash to pay for my gas. Um, so I did it and I got to the observatory and found out that uh, earlier that day, a solar storm had happened. And this satellite called the Galaxy 4 satellite coincidentally had what was called a satellite anomaly. So in the satellite business, when you say satellite anomaly, that means you can kiss this value goodbye. The satellite stops working. Um, $225 million. Um, it just so happens that the Galaxy 4 satellite was handling bank communications and the pay at the pump information that was trying to get to my bank to verify my credit just wasn't getting there because the satellite in that link was gone. So it wasn't just me, it was tens of thousands of people that morning couldn't buy gas and the sun uh, was the source of that. So it was ironic that a solar astronomer was almost prevented from going to the solar telescope by a solar flare, but um, um, it's true. And I don't want to seem like I'm complaining. Pay at the pump is not you know, so critical sometimes. Um, pager information was also lost. So if you're in the hospital and the hospital is trying to get a hold of your doctor with a pager, um, they had trouble and had to use other uh, communications that morning. You know, we've known about this for a while. This is just my personal story, but ever since um, we started using telegraphs in the US in the 1880s, we've known that solar flares and storms on the sun have a direct impact in our lives. So in 1882, um, I'm not, I don't remember this myself, I'm not sure if anyone else does, but um, the Chicago Telegraph switchboard was set on fire because of a solar storm. In 1921, in New York, uh, the Central Railroad was, uh, was stopped, uh, followed by a fire in the control tower. And then as recently as 1989, I'm sure a lot of you remember that there was a power failure in Quebec and six million people were affected, luckily just for one night, but it was a pretty cold night for those people who were affected um, from solar storms. So we know that the sun has um, a lot of power. It can reach into your wallets and you know, make your credit cards null and void, and you're stuck with old fashioned payment methods, or it can shut down your power or uh, burn your telegraph switchboard. I guess that doesn't really apply today, but um, the sun has a direct impact on our daily lives. And this is something that we're really keen on studying at the Solar Observatory. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, we can uh, imagine what's going on on the sun. We know that sunspots are regions where solar flares start and they're regions of intense magnetic fields. The magnetic fields originate from the interior of the sun and when they poke through the surface of the photosphere, we see dark areas called sunspots. Now, if the magnetic field evolves in a certain way, it can reconnect into a lower energy state and that energy difference is then released as a flare. Part of it travels up through the atmosphere of the sun, part of it goes back down to the surface of the sun. Uh, it's a nice cartoon. Notice there are no numbers there, right? Um, we think uh, that sunspots, well, we know that sunspots have intense magnetic fields on the order of 3,000 gauss. You know, so what does that mean? Well, your refrigerator magnets are about 100 gauss. So to get to something that's about 1,000 gauss, you need to have a big a base speaker, and the electromagnet in your base speaker is about a thousand gauss. So to get to a sunspot, you need to make your electromagnet in your speaker the size of 10 Earths, and that's the magnetic field that's going on in, in most sunspots, actually in modest sized sunspots. So that's what's happening on the sun. There's another part to the story about what happens in the trip from the sun to the Earth. This CME, this coronal mass ejection, gets flung off. If it's pointed in the right direction, it'll impact the Earth. And because it's a magnetized plasma, you might expect it'll interact with the magnetic field of the Earth. If it's pointed in just the right direction, it will and cause reconnection. What you can also see is the, the bouncing of the magnetic field lines there. That's what causes a lot of the problem. And then at the end of the event, you see that there's some reconnection that goes on around the Earth's magnetic field, and there's particles that are accelerated that cause aurora at the North and the South Poles. And that's probably a good thing about a solar flare is we get to see beautiful aurora. But when the magnetic field shakes, that induces currents in any conductor that's on the surface of the Earth. 
and that's causing headaches. Going back to what's going on on the sun, this again is a cartoon and you notice no numbers, but this is what we think is happening to uh, initiate a solar flare. The magnetic field up in the corona, so here's the surface of the sun with two sunspots. Higher up in the corona, the magnetic field is in opposite directions. So in one uh, case it's pointing up, and in another case it's pointing back down to the surface of the sun. If those two magnetic fields get close to each other, they can reconnect, and this is what gives the energy to the launch the CME, and then energy to accelerate particles back down to the surface of the sun to, uh, to show the flare that we see in H-alpha, for instance. What we'd like to do at the National Solar Observatory, for instance, is measure the magnetic field here, find out which direction it's going, first of all, and then find out what the magnitude, what the strength of that magnetic field is to find out if it does reconnect, will it be a powerful flare or just a minor flare? So this is work that we're uh, pursuing. Uh, turns out to be difficult. And uh, that's good or bad, uh, it's job security in some ways. But we'd really like to have the answer too. So we know that the corona has magnetic field and uh, the density of the corona is so low that the magnetic field actually controls all of the, the dynamics. Uh, down in the photosphere where there are sunspots, the plasma is really dense and they push the magnetic fields around. The pl plasma moves the magnetic fields. But up in the, the corona, the situation is reversed. The magnetic field controls what the plasma does. Um, so we know that's true. Uh, so the magnetic field is important to understand, but uh, we just can't measure it. The corona is faint for one thing. It's a million times fainter than the disk of the sun. Um, and the magnetic field is weak there. It's a thousand times weaker than the surface of the sun. So we've tried several approaches. One is to uh, extrapolate it using a model. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. And then we have measured it directly. And this is my personal preference, just because I like to observe. Um, we have measured it directly in a few places of the corona, but not with the kind of speed and small size scale that we're going to need to understand solar flares. So I'll just review what we've done so far and then talk about uh, the approach that we're going to use uh, to, to measure the magnetic field in the future. So how do we measure the magnetic field on the sun anyway? We use uh, spectroscopy and polarimetry. So spectropolarimetry. You can impress your friends at dinner tonight with this term. Um, what we do is we look at a spectral line on the sun, and here's one of titanium at uh, the infrared wavelengths of uh, about uh, 2 microns, or 2231 nanometers. If we put a sunspot on the slit of our spectrograph, we see that the line of titanium, which is normally just one spectral line, breaks up into two lines, or actually three, but two components are shifted. Uh, and this shift in the lines uh, is directly proportional to the magnetic field strength in the plasma where that line is formed. So back on the sun, we know that a magnetic field strength of 3,000 gauss is present because these spectral lines are split by a certain number of nanometers. So that's how we get the strength. We can measure the direction of the magnetic field by using polarization. And one form of polarization is circular polarization. Turns out that if a magnetic field is directed upward from the sun, one of these components will be left-handedly polarized and the other will be right-handedly circularly polarized. So using our circular polarimetric uh, instruments, we can measure the uh, polarity of these two components in the spectrum and determine if the magnetic field line is coming out of the sun or going into the sun. We can also measure the direction, the azimuth, with linear polarization, but uh, we won't get into that in, in this talk. That'll be the next lecture and there'll be a test between now and then. So this is how we measure it, but like I said, we're, we're not able to measure it in the corona. We can measure it down in the photosphere, sort of at the ground level for the sun. And we do that at the National Solar Observatory with another telescope, the SOLAS telescope, that takes measurements every day of the magnetic field on the full disk of the sun. So here we see sunspots, which are usually black and white magnetic pairs. And then some of the weaker magnetic fields in the quiet sun. Uh, so this is nice, you're saying, but that's not what you want to measure. So how do we get up into the corona, into the atmosphere of the sun? Well, we can make an approximation and say that above a certain height, the magnetic field is purely radial, just goes in a radial direction away from the sun, it's not complicated by loops or other curvature. And if we do that, we can then fill in the space between the photosphere and that high level by just using uh, Maxwell's equations. We can assume certain things about the electric currents that go in to the system and then use Maxwell's equations um, to draw field lines. 
And you can see that, at least the first order, this works fairly well. We have an image of the solar corona from the NASA um, AIA instrument, where you see sunspots and loops. And the magnetic field lines from an extrapolation model are superposed on this image. And you can see that in some places, the extrapolation uh, model produces loops that correspond with loops on the sun. Um, if we zoom in, other places don't correspond so well. For instance, just above this uh, sunspot pair, it looks like the plasma is moving uh, up and down on the screen, and the magnetic field model predicts the magnetic field should be going left to right. Uh, we know that the plasma is controlled by the magnetic field, so this can't possibly be correct. So here's a, here's a problem with our models. And the basic conclusion is that while uh, the overall global magnetic field is well modeled this way, we can't really use these to predict the details of how a flare is going to erupt. We can't get to the size scales or the accuracy that we need to do that. Um, we're working on more details of the model, of course, but uh, that's where we are now. So we have measured the magnetic field in the corona using uh, telescopes, but it's really difficult. And um, here's probably two of examples of the best state-of-the-art measurements to date. We've got measurements from my colleague Hao Sheng Lin in Hawaii. And you can see he's got data points here in error bars uh, for his measurement of the solar corona magnetic field. He's talking about, um, or this data comes from a time sequence of about two and a half hours. So flares happen uh, in a time sequence of about a minute, and we really want to have magnetic field measurements at that, at that level. So this two and a half hour sequence or data set, even though it's revolutionary in terms of its ability to measure the coronal magnetic field, just won't cut it again to help us predict flares. He's using the uh, Zeeman splitting, just like I described before, but this time of a spectral line coming from the corona. This line is formed in million degree plasma. We can also measure the magnetic field in the cooler parts of the corona, but unfortunately those are very small uh, regions of the corona and really don't give us a, a general picture for a flare that we need. But my grad student Tom Shad used a line from helium, so this is around 10,000 degrees Kelvin, um, and again measured the spectra in all of the Stokes parameters. These are the polarimetric measurements of the spectra. And he has this graph, again, which is state of the art, but you can tell we're not really at the level that we need to be. Um, we've got a lot of noise in it. We see that as we move from a, a high height in the corona down to near the surface, the magnetic field increases, as we expect. It's a few gauss at, in the corona, and it's 1,000 gauss down in the photosphere. And his plot uh, shows uh, an increase like that. But what it also shows is that the extrapolation shown by the orange line doesn't really line up with his measurements, which is something that we know already from, from other comparisons. So uh, one of our hopes uh, and, and goals in the National Solar Observatory is to make more accurate measurements of the corona and do it faster and on a smaller scale. So uh, in order to do that, we're building a new telescope called the Daniel K. Inoue Solar Telescope, or DKIST. This is being built on, uh, on the island of Maui. Uh, and the plan is to revolutionize solar physics with this instrument. We're starting with a four meter mirror. So you can imagine uh, a mirror the size of this carpet and it focuses light about 20 feet away from it. So if you had a magnifying lens this size of the carpet and you focused it 20 feet away, you can fry a whole lot of ants with that kind of power. <laughs> so um, the instrument has a lot of challenges. Uh, there's a huge thermal load on the mirrors and in order to be you know, precise and to produce good focus in your images, we need to control the temperature on all of those mirrors to be something really close to the ambient air temperature, just a few degrees away. Uh, we don't want the mirrors melting. It, that doesn't make for good images. Um, the telescope also is in Hawaii. And uh, because it's so huge, we have to have an altazimuth mount. Uh, the sun's path through the sky is pretty complicated in doing an altazimuth mount and still pointing precisely like we have to on the sun is an engineering challenge as well. On top of that, or I should say below that, if we have instruments down here in what's called the Coudé room, and we don't do anything special to those instruments, the solar image is gonna rotate once per day, or actually in a more complicated way. So we have to rotate the entire inner part of this building as the solar telescope is tracking the sun through the day. So it's an engineering challenge, and it's gonna be marvelous when it's done. Um, I think uh, some of the specifications, you know, to put it in engineering speak technically, 
uh, are smaller than this part of a gnat. <laughs> but it's 137 feet high. Right now, where we've gotten about four stories off of the ground, we've put the foundation in. Uh, I should say that we had a little bit of uh, a delay in the construction. As you know, some of the uh, people in, in Hawaii are not fond of new telescopes going up. But we've been in construction for about a year and a half now. And uh, we expect first light in about 2019. So stay tuned. Um, all of our uh, expectations are that we'll be measuring coronal magnetic fields um, at the resolution that we want to. If we can't uh, really understand uh, all of the details of flares, we'll make a significant uh, leap in our knowledge currently. Here's again this rotating coude room that carries uh, the five instruments for the DKIS telescope. The reason um, that it's on uh, Hawaii is that the infrared sky is very dark there. And the tools that we're going to use are these lines in the infrared part of the coronal spectrum. From 1 to 1.5 microns, my colleague Jeff Kuhn and I went to an eclipse in Chile, and we measured the spectrum there and found a few faint lines that no one had known about and nailed down the wavelengths for other lines. And then from the McMath Pierce Telescope on Kitt Peak, we made measurements of a coronal emission line. It doesn't look like much in this case, but it'll be a significant tool at four microns wavelength, again, to probe the magnetic field there. It turns out as we go to longer wavelengths in the infrared, our sensitivity to magnetic fields increases, and that's why we're pushing the technology to get there. So um, I think this ties the DKIS instrument and our plans there uh, into the idea of eclipses. During a total solar eclipse, when the sun goes away, you just feel something is just wrong. Uh, you know, I've been to two eclipses, I've been busy doing experiments, and, you know, I'm supposed to know what to expect as a solar physicist, right? Um, but when the sun goes away, you just feel it in your stomach. Something is wrong. This is not right. So um, if you do, I don't have the movies linked here, but if you do a search on YouTube for total solar eclipse, you can find out that the reactions that people have it, it, are constant. It doesn't matter if you're in China or if you're from Africa or in India or Libya. No matter who you are or where you are on the planet, when the sun goes away, people react in strange ways. And so in 2017, when the total solar eclipse crosses the United States, I hope that the rest of you will actually travel to see it, if not for the science that I'm going to talk about, but just for the, for the personal, for the human experience of being in this strange place and seeing this wonderful and weird thing happen, a total solar eclipse. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, my colleagues and the history of eclipses. So we can go back 50 years to the total solar eclipse of 1965, um, as you can expect, the shadow of the moon doesn't care where it lands on the Earth, right? So most of the tracks of total solar eclipses occur over the ocean because most of the surface of the Earth is covered in ocean. And this total solar eclipse occurred um, over the South Pacific with just a tiny bit hitting the coast of South America. But if you look really closely, there's a tiny little island called Moto One in the South Pacific uh, which experienced the eclipse. So uh, in 1965, when uh, times were different, should I say, and there is more uh, resources, there are more resources available. Uh, my colleagues would go on uh, eclipse trips. So here they are boarding a plane in uh, Los Angeles, flew to Honolulu, uh, took a schooner trip uh, across the South Pacific, uh, ended up on the island, uh, ditched all of their uh, jackets and uh, ties, went to uh, no shirts and swim trunks, and they did really good science. Okay, it was an adventure, of course, but they built telescopes there. Uh, they observed the total solar eclipse. And in 1965, we didn't know a lot of, of about the corona like we do now. So there were scientific papers that came out of this experiment um, that revolutionized what we do. The, these are now some of the leaders in solar physics, the authors of these papers. If you look carefully, though, some of them um, were published in 1970, so five years after the eclipse. I mean, it's difficult to get there and to build the experiments. But the data is also difficult to analyze. So um, in this case, it took some people five years to get the results out. If we go to the McMath Pierce Telescope, we explore some of the storage tunnels there. We go to the back of this very dark and isolated storage tunnel. I can show you a crate that has the 1965 Eclipse telescopes in it. And I don't think anyone's opened it since, I don't know, maybe 1968. Here's the Celius stat that they used to track the sun, and here's the film that they used to collect the solar images. So this is kind of different and maybe not a good 
thing about Eclipse experiments in the past is that uh, certainly this, this equipment hasn't been used in 50 years and uh, it's sort of wasting itself uh, out in the, in the storage warehouse. Uh, maybe I didn't mention the real reason to go to a solar eclipse is that the background of the sky brightness is reduced by a factor of 10,000 or 100,000 uh, in a total solar eclipse. When we measure the corona, which is a million times fainter than the disk of the sun, it's what's called a background-limited uh, problem in astrophysics. And so we have to go to places or take extreme measures to reduce the background as much as we can in order to make these measurements. So uh, in the 1960s, we would have 30 people going off to a Pacific island and uh, doing great science, but they would take their time and publish five years later. I know from the first couple of slides, you know I don't have a team of 30 people working at the telescope. And the instrument funding is competitive. Uh, people don't fund instruments for uh, eclipses so much now. We do want to improve some things, though. You know, 50 years later now, the world is very different. Uh, you know, I'm hoping that you're all paying attention, but uh, if somebody isn't tweeting about this talk right now, then it doesn't happen, right? The world will deny that it ever happened. Or if it's not on Facebook in a half an hour, what lecture? So no one's going to wait five years for a science paper to come out. People want to know right now what happened and what did you learn from the eclipse. Something that we can improve is that, uh, you know, we don't want the instruments languishing in a crate in a storage lo location for 50 years. We want them to be uh, used after the eclipse as well. And we want the data to be freely accessible. My colleagues at NASA are very good about this, and we're doing the same thing at the National Solar Observatory. But if we take data, we want our colleagues in Europe or in Africa or in Australia to be able to do science with that data as well. So how do we do this? How do we uh, overcome the challenges and make the improvements that we want to? Well, we've got something that they didn't have in 1965. We've got citizen science. The fact that, for instance, all of you are here in this room listening is a powerful tool uh, that scientists are starting to use, trying to understand now. Um, and we're going to try to do that. So for the 2017 eclipse, um, some of my colleagues, uh, Hugh Hudson and Scott McIntosh, have come up with uh, the idea called the Eclipse Mega Movie Project where the idea was originally to have people along the eclipse path, and there are 10 million people who live along this path, go out and record the eclipse with their iPhone and upload that data, and at a later time that would be made into a movie of the eclipse. The eclipse goes from Oregon uh, across the middle U.S. and exits in South Carolina. Um, I got to thinking about, well, what happens instead of, uh, if instead of using iPhones, we use telescopes? and had people with telescopes scattered along the eclipse path. I don't know 60 solar astronomers that would do that, so it would have to rely on volunteers, people who, who know and love uh, telescopes and, and the sun. Um, so we would recruit a bunch of citizen scientists and some professional astronomers as well to be stationed along the eclipse path. So every project you know, needs a name, and so I call this the Continental America Telescopic eclipse experiment, or the Citizen Kate experiment. Now, um, turns out there's a movie that has a name close to this. I'm not sure if you've seen it. Um, it's pure coincidence. Uh, but another coincidence, it turns out that Rosebud, Missouri, is in the path of totality. So if you're in Rosebud, Missouri, on August 21st, sitting in the, the, the city park, where one of our sites is going to be located, um, the moon shadow will pass over you. And for two and a half minutes, you'll be able to see the corona, the atmosphere of the sun. Um, but the thing to really key in, and the way that this project is different, is that if you look at the time that the eclipse starts in, in Oregon, and compare that with the time the eclipse ends as the moon shadow exits South Carolina, there's 90 minutes of time that elapse. So the idea is, by placing telescopes along the eclipse path at the right sites, taking data as the shadow crosses those sites, and then recombining it after the fact, we'll get a a movie that'll be 90 minutes in duration of the corona, of the atmosphere of the sun, instead of just two and a half minutes. So every project needs a bumper sticker, and I wish I'd printed them out. I'm sorry, I don't have them yet. Uh, but it's got our slogan, 2,500 miles, 60 telescopes, and 90 minutes of totality. You can see some of the sites uh, along the eclipse path here. Um, and sure enough, as soon as I started talking about this, people became excited about this and have volunteered their time. Um, it's, it's just amazing. Some of the people are on the slide. Alexandra Hart is from uh, the UK, and she's never traveled to the United States. Hopefully, she'll be here for the eclipse. 
But what she did is she donated several weekends of her time and used Google Earth to locate 60 sites along the eclipse path, you know, accounting for forests and roads and ease of access um, at parks and at schools along the eclipse path. Um, now, that, that's a great site, but, or that's a great job, but we're going to rely on people who actually live there, like uh, Dan Glomsky, who lives in Nebraska, to go out and do a ground truth measurement of those sites to make sure that they're, they're the best places for people to be. Uh, Ron Cottrell is in Tucson, and he's helped with a prototype instrument, uh, developing that, and I'll talk about some results that we've gotten from that. And then Bob Baer from Illinois, from Carbondale, has been doing most of the work in this project. And uh, for those of you who, who may know, there's going to be another solar eclipse in, uh, in 2024, and it turns out the path of the 2017 and the path of the 2024 eclipse just cross over Carbondale, Illinois. So if you're going to buy a house and you want to you know, see solar eclipses, uh, I hear real estate is pretty expensive there now. Uh, but Bob will see an eclipse out of his backyard seven years later, too. And then Teresa and Claude Plymate are colleagues of mine who are also helping out. Now it's mostly in logistics and in, in, uh, in science justification for the experiment. So to, to get a vision of what we want, I mean, I'm in it for the science, okay? I'll admit that selfishly. There's wonderful science about the dynamics of the corona that we can do with this data set, and I'll mention that. But to make it a, a bigger and a more visible project, um, we're trying to develop a vision about what we want to happen. And so we want to unify people. Uh, we want to make them aware that they're part of something bigger than, than themselves. We want to uh, reignite a new wave of citizen science, especially in astronomy in, in the country. And of course, we want to inspire students who will be doing this in, in the next uh, 50 years and show them exactly how to become a scientist, give them a direct route to this path. So I think we're doing this. Um, and this is how, um, in terms of unifying people, the observers will be part of a team that stretches across the US. Um, but again, along the lines of it, it didn't happen unless it's on Facebook, um, we've got four hours from the time the eclipse ends in South Carolina until the evening news. And you know where I'll be. I'll be working my butt off during that four hours to get the movie out so that these people can see their work on CNN or CBS that night. Every research paper that will come out of that will cite all of the volunteers in the project. So the research, uh, I think, will last for many years, five or ten years after the fact. And all the uh, volunteers will be part of those papers. This is sort of a, maybe a little crazy idea that I've had. Um, but instead of paying for people's travel, which would be almost impossible to do, and instead of just trying to excite them about the research, um, I think that there should be a tangible benefit to being a volunteer in this project. And what I'd like to see is that the people keep the telescopes after the eclipse, is that they train with it for a few months, they take data during the eclipse. After the eclipse, they bring it to their house. These are people who are going to have to take Monday off from work, going to have to drive out to some place in Nebraska uh, on their own. Um, so they're motivated. These are people who are going to use the equipment. And so after the eclipse, we're going to provide a whole menu of different citizen science projects that can be done, solar or nighttime work. And uh, I think that it's the right thing to do to keep the telescopes in the hands of these people. And in terms of inspiring students, we've got high school students that will be taking data. Uh, I'll force them to analyze and reduce the data as well. And then they'll be part of the publication process. So they'll know firsthand what the experience is like from going from observations uh, into science. So that's the plan. Uh, we're working with vendors. And uh, Daystar uh, Filters has stepped up. And they've given us the telescopes for the project. So we'll have between 60 and 100 telescopes. We're still working on the specifications for the project. And uh, we're working now, I'm talking to vendors here about uh, the other components of the telescope system. So um, we've got part of it built up. And we're hoping that in the next year or so, we'll have the entire system uh, sponsored by corporate and private money. The problem with, uh, I mean, I'm used to talking to people at NSF and NASA to get funding for projects. But the problem is, if we use public money, then we just can't give these telescopes away. They would have to be returned. And I don't think that's the right thing to do. So I'll be working my tail off to try to get more corporate sponsors uh, involved and interested. As I said, the science that we will do is, is a science that's hidden behind that black oval. Um, even from space, we can't study this part of the corona very well. And my colleague Serge Kuchmi has shown how an eclipse really opens a window for that region from about one to two solar radii. Here's in red, 
is the field of view of one of the space coronagraphs. In the psychedelic colors is the image of the disk of the sun. And you can see that the data from a solar eclipse in the black and white fills in this region. There's amazing solar physics that goes on here. The solar wind is less than a kilometer per second at the base of that. And when you get to the boundary, the solar wind is moving at 100 kilometers per second. So there's a massive acceleration of these particles that we just don't see. We also know that the magnetic field is twisted and, and loop-like on the, on the surface of the sun, low down in the corona. When we get out into these coronal uh, coronagraph regions, we can see it's mostly radial, so there's a transition between a loop structure and a radial structure that occurs in this region, and that actually has a lot of impact on the extrapolation models that we use. So there's critical solar physics that goes on in this region that we can't do either from the ground or for space right now, and a solar eclipse really opens up a window to allow us to study that part of the corona, that slice, where important things happen. Has this been done before? Uh, and it turns out it has but on a limited basis. Uh, Pasikoff and Hanaoka have published studies where they've had two sites in the path of a total solar eclipse where they've measured the corona. Here are some images from Jay Pasikoff from a 2008 eclipse where you see uh, an image of the corona from the eclipse at, at one moment, then 19 minutes later, an image taken at another location. We're hoping to use similar types of equipment, so getting similar types of resolution, but to get 200 times more frames. 200 times more data by having a 10 second cadence between our frames. It'll depend on what kind of signal to noise we want. Uh, but having a 90 minute duration, which is something that no one's done before. So the eclipse in 2017 is unique and provides us with a great chance to do this. Um, and by being able to do this, being able to measure the corona for so long, we'll be able to study the dynamics, things that change with time in the corona. 2017 should be a solar minimum period with very few sunspots. So we may not be able to see a coronal mass ejection, but I'll show you some of the science that we can do if, if we did, or some of the ideas that we have. What we do know will be visible are the polar plumes that come out of the north and the south poles of the sun. Actually, during the 2017 eclipse, you should expect to see a, just a bipolar magnetic structure in the corona, and the poles will dominate that. So the evolution of what we call polar plumes is sort of the main science focus of this data. The data is simply white light images across a wide wavelength range, um, just onto a, a bare uh, CMOS detector or a CCD detector. We don't have any uh, special filters in the system. So let's look at what uh, we know about polar plumes now and what we can address with the data from this uh, eclipse experiment. Maybe a little difficult to see, but we know that polar plumes extend down to the photosphere of the sun, and there they coincide with two magnetic bipoles. So there's magnetic structures. These are very weak magnetic fields, nothing like in a sunspot, but somehow they interact. This plume then is launched off from this magnetic structure and extends well out past the two solar radius, you know, our field of view for the eclipse. Um, what we see or what other people have seen using certain spacecraft during certain um, uh, experiment runs is between a 3 and a 15% variation in the intensity of these things. That's a huge range. Uh, so there's some inconsistencies between the studies that have been done so far because they've been hard. We know that they extend across the whole field of view that we'll have for the eclipse experiment, one to two solar radii. People report sometimes seven minute periodicities, sometimes 15 minute periodicities in these uh, events and they report that they flow out from the sun at velocities actually sometimes as low as 30 kilometers per second up to 210 kilometers per second. So there's a a factor of two in the periods that people report in the studies that have been done, and there's a factor of uh, three in the velocities that they report. So um, the bottom line is that we really don't know what's going on so well with these uh, polar plume dynamic events. The Kate experiment will study these and we'll be able to measure exactly um, what, what's happening. So Pasikov and his uh, co-workers um, took those two images from the eclipse in 2008 uh, one image from a station here in uh, southern Russia and one from uh, Mongolia. Um, it turns out that uh, in 2017 in the United States there are a lot more roads than there are here. So we can't fault them for only having two stations. It's a really difficult part of the world uh, to get to. So what do they see? Well, here are two images um, from their paper and they point out that there's a plume here uh, in one image that isn't seen in this other image. Um, but, you know, like any good scientist, I 
scanned their images, uh, rotated them, shifted them, and aligned them. So we can compare them more directly. Here's the first image and the second image. If I blink back and forth between the two, you can see that this plume in particular does seem to show a lot of change across the 19 minutes of time. But if you look at other fainter things, there, things are moving around all over the place. And the truth is, with just two images 19 minutes apart, you really can't tell what's going on. It's hard to get a feel for what the evolution actually is. Um, I've looked at this and blinked this back and forth for hours and hours. And sometimes I can see things moving to the left and sometimes moving to the right. Sometimes I can actually see radial outflow like we're supposed to see from the spacecraft studies. But we know things are, are changing there. And the Citizen Kate experiment will really uh, produce a data set that will really uh, nail this down uh, with much finer temporal resolution and for a much longer period, for 90 minutes, not just 19 minutes. If there's a CME, a coronal mass ejection, during the 90 minutes of the eclipse, and it's not likely, like I said, but there has been one in the past two eclipses that people have observed, so maybe we'll see one. Uh, if there is one, we'll be able to measure it very well again with the Kate data set. Here again are images from the Pasikoff uh, experiment in the 2008 uh, eclipse. And you can see, uh, if you look at these two images closely, you can see a prominence, a sort of pink material, <clears throat> and changes in the corona as this coronal mass ejection starts to lift off of, of the sun. But here they are aligned and stretched. And if I blink back and forth between them, you can certainly see a lot of dynamics happening between the two images. What we think is going on in these coronal mass ejections, and bear with me for a second, but we think we're looking down the axis of a magnetic flux rope. So imagine we're looking down the axis of a slinky with coils, and then part of those coils in the middle are being plucked up for some reason and uh, lifted up to higher altitudes, and the prominence sits down on a lower rung of one of those coils. So now that I've planted that into your brain, hopefully you can see the same thing that I've seen, uh, sort of uh, loop-like structures, some of a few loops up here that move upward and drag the prominence material upward with them. So if we're lucky enough to capture one of these coronal mass ejections during the 2017 eclipse, um, we'll be able to observe this with much better time resolution and for a much longer duration and, uh, and nail down the dynamics of what's, what's going on. What are we going to use at all of the sites? What type of instrument can collect the data that we need to uh, study these events? It turns out to be quite a modest instrument, and that's good because we're going to need 60 or 100 of them. Um, we bought a prototype instrument in January at the NSO, and uh, we used just an 80 millimeter uh, refractor uh, with a F7, so 560 uh, millimeter uh, focal length. The uh, mount is uh, actually necessary. In two and a half minutes, the sun will move across the sky enough so that we want to track that. So we've got a battery-powered uh, RA drive. Um, so the whole thing is portable, right? There's no electricity on exit 24 of Highway 54 in Nebraska. We want to make sure that it's portable. The camera is, is a good camera, and I'll talk, there are reasons for that, but we've got a 2K by 2K a CMOS camera. It can operate at 90 frames per second or 45 frames per second. It writes really quickly um, via USB 3 with a 5.5 micron pixel. For the calibration that we need, because everybody is going to insert the camera a little bit differently into the telescope, so in terms of pixel coordinates, we're going to need to know what direction west is, say. We're going to do some calibrations on the partial phase, and we need a neutral density filter for those calibrations. Um, we'll need a laptop to control the camera and store the data. And I apologize to everybody in the audience, but we use Windows 8 for the prototype. I'm sorry. Um, but the good news about that is that the prototype uh, itself costs uh, only $2,700. With um, the telescope uh, accounting for about 20% of the cost, and with our hope for getting uh, bulk discounts, um, we're hoping to f buy 60 or 100 of these and just give them to the, uh, the vent or to the uh, volunteers. In uh, late January, I did some tests from Tucson uh, to verify that we had the sensitivity in the system. So here's an image of the sun. I've subtracted out the limb darkening, really stretched the contrast. Uh, sunspots are completely blackened out. Um, but we can see faint structures on the surface of the sun called plage. These are weaker magnetic fields on the sun. 
but it means that we're, we've got a very sensitive system. Can we observe the corona? I mean, is it sensitive enough to see the corona out to two solar radii where we, where we really want to measure it? Um, you know, I'd like to order an eclipse over Tucson uh, and use the prototype to do that, but we can't. So at least uh, back in January, the thing that I tested was to look at Earth shine off the back of a crescent moon. So Earth shine, of course, is sunlight bouncing off of the clouds on the Earth and illuminating the dark side or the dark part of the moon. In a solar eclipse, the Earth shine, um, uh, because of the geometry, the Earth shine is the brightest. So it's brighter than it is here during the crescent phase of the moon. And the Earth shine is also brighter than the corona at two solar radii. So the fact that we can see Earth shine with the instrument in a crescent moon phase means that we have the sensitivity to see the corona out to two solar radii. So of course the solar filter was taken off to do this and you know as long as I was out in the backyard I tried taking a picture of the Orion Nebula with the system. So here's my first actually nighttime photo of Orion Nebula. Um, it's about time I guess, I've been in astronomy for a while. But the telescope you know is a fully functioning 80 millimeter telescope with a good detector and this is how we hope to use it in other experiments after the eclipse for other citizen science. So I think the telescope and the system is sensitive enough to uh, accomplish this, and the cost is about right. We may be able to find ways to actually provide all of those. What about the other part of this? Can we actually train 60 or 100 volunteers to take data during totality? I mean, it's, the total solar eclipse is the ultimate deadline. Um, you know, the sun is going to cross the moon, or the moon is going to cross the sun at exactly you know, 12, 38, and 42 seconds if you're in uh, you know, Rosebud, Missouri. And if your instrument isn't working, you're not going to be able to stop the moon. It's going to happen whether you're ready or not. So can we take these volunteers and actually train them to be you know, uh, uh, familiar enough with the equipment to function at that sort of uh, uh, deadline? Uh, so it turns out that we had a workshop in Columbia, Missouri recently. And uh, we had a volunteer from that workshop call me up and say, Matt, I'm going to a total solar eclipse in the Faroe Islands off of Europe on March 20th you know, do you think you can mail the telescope to my hotel? I'd, I'd be willing to take data. So we thought, yeah, that's, that's only four weeks away. Sure, why not? Well, the path of the total solar eclipse went across most of the North Atlantic, as you know, only encountered land at the Faroe Islands and then at Svalbard. Um, basically, Santa lives there, so uh, Fred Isbener decided not to go there, but instead to visit the Faroe Islands on his trip through Europe. For about two days, Fred was trained in Illinois um, one of those days was clear and sunny. Uh, he was trained on Windows 8. Uh, he was trained with the demo software for the, uh, for the uh, camera. And, uh, and still, uh, the, the man had never taken a digital image through a telescope before, so this was his first experience. Hopefully, I haven't turned him off to it. But Bob Baer did an excellent job. Uh, Fred set up his tripod in the rain. Uh, really optimistic person. And it paid off. He, uh, after putting on his raincoat, uh, it turns out that he got a break in the clouds about 10 minutes before totality. So he took some of the calibration data that we need. He saw totality for about 30 seconds and was able to capture about 40 images of the solar corona. We had a plan that Fred would take one exposure for the inner corona and then manually change the exposure and take an exposure to show the outer corona, but it clouded over before he could do that. And so we only ran the test for the inner corona. And, uh, and yes, it was a resounding success. This is his first you know, sort of digital image through a solar telescope taken you know, with this kind of deadline and pressure halfway around the world from his house. So we think that we, uh, we uh, demonstrated with Fred that we, we are able to train people to do this. And in his case, it was even harder. He had to travel through Europe and use some really crummy software to take data. There's some problems, uh, only one exposure value, and the focus is not quite you know, very nice in this. He had only a few moments during the partial phase to adjust the focus. So we're hoping for 2017 that when people have the eclipse going on in their backyard uh, and they don't have to travel so far and have more better weather, we'll get much better data. So it turns out there's an eclipse in 2016 in Indonesia. And uh, the weather forecast is not so good, but as the Faroe Islands experiment demonstrated, you can't rely on the weather. So the plan is, right now, we're looking for funding to send four students, and these are students from along the eclipse path, so from the University of Wyoming, uh, from Illinois, from Kentucky, and from South Carolina. Buy them prototype telescopes, send them along the eclipse path in Indonesia to four different sites, train them on how to use the telescopes, and collect data. 
The key, though, is after the eclipse, when they come home, hopefully they come home, um, they will be experts on the eclipse equipment. They will have taken it around the world again and used it in much more difficult situations than Nebraska. So we will employ them for another year to train the volunteers along the eclipse path. And because they're coming from states already along the eclipse path, um, that means they'll be training in their home turf. And uh, it'll provide an experience for them as well as for the volunteers uh, that I think uh, will be unmatched. Um, so in conclusion, the ideas that I hope you take away from the talk is that um, we live in the outer atmosphere of the sun, and it's not so surprising then that storms on the sun can cause problems here on the Earth. We're working really hard at the uh, NSO um, to understand the magnetic field changes that cause flares, cause these storms. And uh, we're doing that with the telescopes we have now, but also with the DKIS telescope, which we'll see first light in 2019. And finally, a total solar eclipse, which will happen very soon, opens a window on a slice of the corona that we can't study very well in any other way. And with your help and help of other citizen scientists, we hope to provide this, this new uh, data set that will allow us to study the dynamics in this region and further improve our understanding of the, of the solar corona. Uh, these are the references that I used, and here's my contact information in case you're interested in becoming involved. Okay, thank you. The telescope has revolutionized the human experience countless times since its creation some 400 years ago. Celestron is doing our part to continue the evolution of the telescope and expand the horizons of the human mind. For decades, Celestron has been committed to providing individuals with high-quality telescopes and optical instruments at affordable prices. We strive to clear the way for intellectually curious people around the globe to experience and explore deeper into nature and the cosmos. When I think of Celestron, I automatically think of the people. Um, to me, a company is people. We have people that are passionate about what they do. And we have extremely talented individuals that work for this company. And I think it takes those, um, those intangibles to create great product. Founded in 1960 in Los Angeles, California, Celestron has been an industry leader in telescopes for over 50 years. As the world's largest telescope brand, we continue to develop technological innovations that set the pace of the industry. Celestron is synonymous with inspired design and state-of-the-art technologies. As an industry leader, we strive to remain the world's most innovative telescope brand. As a rapidly growing outdoors company, Celestron focuses on products that enhance the exploration of the great outdoors. As a champion of STEM education and the arts, we pursue the advancement of public scientific understanding. Our long-standing track record supporting astronomy, education, and outdoor-related nonprofits across the globe speaks to the values we hold dear. Celestron is committed to encouraging the exploration of our natural world in fun and unique ways. There's like a lifetime of good memories at Celestron. It's probably 
one of our star parties. I'd say probably at the Badlands when we had in the middle of nowhere a crowd of hundreds of kids coming off of school buses, coming up and observing the sun for the very first time through a telescope. I've had so many amazing experiences here at Celestron, from helping assist with the setup of equipment with Stephen Hawking, to the very humbling experience of a standing ovation after we announced to teachers at the National Science Teacher Convention that we were donating the binoculars to them. One that definitely stands out as a uh as kind of an achievement in my career was when we launched the SIVO telescopes, the Celestron Evolution. That was a really proud moment for me to be able to look at the people that I've essentially had grown up with and spent my career and be sort of at the pinnacle of achievement and be able to sort of unveil that and communicate that to, to all these people that I've, I highly respect and have worked with a, a long time. One of the things that makes a company great is great employees. We just strive to push the envelope to really accommodate the needs of our customers. Those are the keys to what drives Celestron and what makes us successful. Our goal is to inspire a sense of wonder, curiosity, and fun in our communities and throughout our company. We desire to be a vehicle that helps drive humanity's insatiable desire to know the universe. My vision for Celestron would be taking all those qualities, the the companies built upon and taking them into the future, into the next generation. And so we need to be continually evolving as a company. As someone that's been in this industry a long time, I do think that Celestron's best days are now and the even better days lie right ahead of us. We dedicate our work to opening the eyes of the people around the world and enhancing their view of the cosmos into the past and on to the future.